when I came here with Dr. Oster and I was replacing Dr. Osborne and Dr. Lewis was still here, the reputation for the classes in New Testament department was uh, killer academics. <laughs> and I was determined that I was not going to show up as a lightweight. Mm. And it, it was not just what I required required students to do those first few years, mm -hmm. but it was also the nature of the material I had them read. Okay. And I don't think that material was unimportant, but I had them read highly academic kinds of material right. without uh, much word of application. And I think that that is something that's continued to change throughout the 38 years is I, I think I've hopefully matured in my understanding of what's needed by the local preacher, mm -hmm. the local associate preacher, by people working with churches yeah. and directed more and more of what I do in that direction. Not that I don't try also to teach people like yourself who are going to go on and do work in uh, PhD work. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and of course, that PhD work for you has all along and been alongside of church work and right. is now uh, church work, basically with kind of academic work on the side. Uh, right. Yeah. Yeah. And so I would say that that's a major change. Dr. Blank, I want to say that I am so excited to be able to have this conversation with you. I, I, I promise you, I, I literally texted some friends of uh, it was some folks that we know earlier today to say, guys, look at these questions that I'm going to ask Alan Black later. This is going to be a lot of fun. And so I'm, I'm happy that you are able to join us to, uh, to, to kind of reflect a little bit on, on your career. As uh, you mentioned um, a few weeks ago now at the time of recording, that you're planning on retiring at the end of this school year. And so before we get into the, you know, the, the real heart of our interview, I was wondering, would you be willing to take just a minute to tell us a little bit about, uh, you know, how long you've been teaching, where you've been teaching, um, you know, what, do you do any kinds of teaching things at, uh, at, at the church you attend? Uh, help us get to know uh, the, the venerable Alan Black. <laughs> Thank you. Let me let me say before I start any of that how thrilled I am to be interviewed <laughs> and to be interviewed by you. Uh, mm -hmm. You worked as my uh, GA for several years. You helped me in teaching Greek online and uh, taught Greek by yourself online and are doing it again for us mm -hmm. as an adjunct. Yeah. And uh, we're, we're extremely proud of you and what you've done. I'm proud of what you did here. NHST and of what you've done to Asbury. And we are continued working uh, with the church there in Corpus Christi. Christi. Corpus Christi, Corpus that's Christi, right. Yeah. Not Crispy. <laughs> yeah, that, it sounds like a great name for a fried chicken restaurant, Corpus Christi. It does. It does. So I appreciate you asking me. Mm -hmm. um, I left here from my MDiv which was at that time called a Master of Theology, mm -hmm. uh, MTH, and uh, finished it in actually 80, but I left here in 77 with about three courses left to go. And I finished those courses while I was preaching in Atlanta mm -hmm. uh, for a church there called Moreland Avenue. I preached there for six years, the first three of which I finished my work here, second three of which um, I was working at Emory on my PhD in New Testament there. And that was a wonderful experience. And so I came here in 83, ABD, mm -hmm. that is uh, all but dissertation. Mm -hmm. And it, it was a great blessing for me. I had uh, finished my exams for my doctorate and had uh, worked out, sketched out, and got a prospectus approved for my dissertation. And was kind of near the beginning of that work. and. Uh, had the great fortune 
of Dr. Carol Osborne, who had did a lot for me when I was here and had left, had just left, that he left because I didn't think yeah. I'd ever be coming here. This was teaching at Harding School of Theology, Harding Graduate School at the time was my dream job. Mm -hmm. But I was sure it would never happen because I was sure that Dr. Oster, who is still here, would be here forever. And that you weren't wrong Dr. about that. Here forever. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's you right. weren't wrong about That's Dr. Right. Oster. <laughs> So I thought, you know, all of my career, they will be there. Uh, but then uh, Dr. Osborne decided to go out to Pepperdine. And so I was privileged to be able to come here in 83. Mm -hmm. I finished my dissertation in those first two years while I was teaching here, 83 to 85. And so just a little before I turned 35, I finished up my dissertation. Yeah, your dissertation and is as old as I am. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was born in 85 yeah <laughs> so i was i was finishing my dissertation when you were being born <laughs> pretty remarkable so yeah. i I've, I've had the great privilege of being here for 38 years mm -hmm. and the last six years of those have been as the dean of my my true love throughout that period has been teaching the new testament and yeah been my privilege to be able to teach some of the basic courses like exegesis and New Testament introduction, mm -hmm. and then also to, uh, to teach the Gospels yeah. at various levels, both at the master's level and at the deacon level. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, you, you have, uh, you've been able to teach really a, a, a very wide range of things ranging from classes like elementary Greek, all the way to, uh, we took a Greek-based, uh, I, I and, a, and a few other classmates took a Greek-based seminar in the book of Hebrews with you, which is on the far other end of the scale when it comes to qual the quality of Greek that you're dealing with, yeah. It yeah. is, it's a tremendous difference. Yeah, Dr. Oster and I, up until I became dean, Dr. Oster, Dr. Oster and I always split elementary Greek and Greek readings so that whoever the students started with, they would end up with having all three courses with that particular one and we mm -hmm. would alternate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And these days you mentioned that you, you, uh, you farmed out the responsibility of elementary Greek to, uh, right. to a lowly adjunct down here in Corpus Christi, Texas. <laughs> And you've, you've been great. We knew that you would be, and you have been. You had Appreciate experience that. at it and done a terrific job. Yeah. And I've told several people before that pedagogically, you're a better teacher than I am. That, so. that, that means the world for me to hear you say that, Dr. Bunk. I, I appreciate that. At the time of recording, uh, it was just yesterday that we had our last, uh, last meeting of Greek 2 before these guys take their exams. And uh, I complimented uh, both the, the credit students and the auditors who, these two auditors that I had, um, they stuck with it. Uh, one of them had a, had a medical condition that uh, kept him from being able to attend class for a, a few weeks in the semester. But they, uh, they stuck with it. They turned in homework. They participated in class. They were contributing to class discussion, and it, it really created a, a very high, high sense of fellowship or a, a sense of high degree of fellowship with that group. And it was nice because, you know, especially one of the auditors is going to be taking the Greek readings class that Dr. Oster will, uh, will offer next fall semester uh, alongside of his other classmates who were taking the class for credit. So it, it's been kind of a neat, neat experience. Um, I, I told them yesterday, I, I could have asked for a, a better group of, uh, of, of folks to start my foray into to teaching in that um, you know, kind of synchronous format. Because when I taught last, uh, last time back in 2016 and 2017, it was, it was what was called online. And so it was asynchronous. Yes. Um, these days, I t also teach online, but it's in this format uh, via Zoom, and um, they they they've been very great to show me grace when something was unclear, 
or when and we needed to make adjustments uh, either with schedule or things along those lines. Um, and they you know, they appreciated my grace and I extended to them you know as needed. And so it it, it was a really rewarding experience. And um, I, I I mean I cut my teeth on uh, on teaching Greek with uh, with Dwayne Warden back in Searcy yes. uh, while I was his uh, teacher's assistant in undergrad, but then had the opportunity to, uh, to follow in, uh, in our mutual friend, uh, Pavo Tucker's footsteps and, uh, and got to be your, uh, your GA there uh, the last three of my four years there at HST. Um, this, I know uh, I have changed <clears throat> as a teacher, not just from uh, 2016, 2017 school year to now, but even from the fall until now, you said you've been teaching for 38 years. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you, are there, is there something you can look at and say, this is, this is one area in which I can tell that I have really changed as a teacher over these many years? There are many areas. <laughs> that I can say that about. And I'm sure that if I taught another 30 years, there would still be constant changes <laughs> going on. But uh, among, among those things, one is that through that time, I became more pastoral and less academic. Mm. That is, I, I think I have become more of a teacher of preachers, of master divinity type students, than a teacher of an MA, uh, more academic focused kind of program. Mm -hmm. When I came here uh, with Dr. Oster and I was replacing Dr. Osborne and Dr. Lewis was still here, the reputation for the classes in the New Testament department was uh, killer academics. <laughs> and I was determined that I was not going to show up as a lightweight. Mm. And so I, it, it was not just what I required students to do those first few years, mm -hmm. but it was also the nature of the material I had them read. Okay. And I don't think that material was unimportant, but I had them read highly academic kinds of material right. without uh, much word of application. Mm. And uh, I think that, that is something that's continued to change throughout the 38 years is I've, I think I've hopefully matured in my understanding of what's needed by the local preacher, mm -hmm. the local associate preacher, by people working with churches yeah. and directed more and more of what I do in that direction. Not that I don't try also to teach people like yourself who are going to go on and do work in um, PhD work, mm. uh, and and of course that PhD work for you has all along and been alongside of church work, and right. is now uh, church work, basically with kind of academic work on the side. Uh, right, yeah, yeah. And so I would say that that's a major change. Mm -hmm. uh, another is that I would say I moved from almost completely lecture. Mm -hmm to more and more discussion. And I think that is an important feature. I, the, when, when I got here, I have tremendous respect for Dr. Lewis. He taught me so much and he was an excellent teacher, but he, he had for all of his classes and part of it is the rest of us weren't ready to do this. He had a typed out verbatim set of notes with the jokes in the, he, he didn't I've always heard that. Yeah. He didn't do anything that was not set on that set of notes. And they had jokes written into them. And uh, he would he would get up and and read and lecture from a not an outline, but a verbatim set of notes that he composed for each of the he probably taught 50 or 50 something different courses, which I never taught anything wow. like that. Yeah. Other than it's like fifty or plus new preps, at, right? You know, over the course of his career, but that, that's that's wildly impressive. It is, and that but that lecture style, uh, where he he took fairly few questions, 
Mm -hmm. And the questions that were asked, he answered them briefly and moved on. That lecture style was the style when he was coming through doing his two PhDs. <laughs> that was the style he used during his entire time here. Mm -hmm. And contemporary teachers who primarily and almost exclusively lecture lose a large percentage of their students. Interesting, yeah. And yeah. so things have moved in a more and more discussion-oriented direction. Right. And the, the issue there is to try to get the students to do preparation before they come to class. Right. So that discussion <laughs> yeah. is not what Dr. Lewis used to say it was, and that was a pooling of ignorance. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Ta talking, uh, talking a lot about, um, about typical Sunday morning, or, you know, Sunday Bible school classes, things like that. It's, it's, and it's interesting too because you, if you can get the students to buy in and do some kind of uh, some kind of legwork beforehand, in some ways it might make the teachers prep a little bit easier. But in other ways, it does require more of the students because they're not there just to. And if you're if you're really getting the most out of a lecture, you shouldn't be listening passively anyway. But uh, the default setting for a lot of folks is just sort of passively listening in a in a more discussion based type class, which at the doctoral level is often termed a seminar. That's right. You have uh, yeah. you have the expectation of folks who will have done the legwork beforehand, and they will come to class ready to comment um, intelligently on really anything that's relevant for what you're going to be talking about that day. It's kind of scary if you actually do the prep work, but if you do it, you're going to know that material really well. I would say there's definitely been a push towards uh, discussion as opposed to lecturing. And yeah. of course, towards um, assisting your class in some way or another by something that is um, uh, visible. You know, when I first started teaching, we, we, what we probably had at the time was an overhead projector. <laughs> yeah. And so, yeah. so things have changed tremendously. And that, that's part of everything that has happened, of course, uh, in the 21st century, mm -hmm. especially, is the blossoming of technology. And what we're doing right now was impossible not that many years ago yeah. to do this kind of recording. And so all these kind of things, you know, now we, we assume as you've spoken about for classes and mm -hmm. you're teaching a, a great benefit of teaching Greek on Zoom instead of teaching it by the old fashioned sort of strictly online asynchronous method is your students actually learn how to pronounce the words yeah. as no letters because they hear them pronounced. Right, yeah. And uh, when, when you're trying to do everything the other way, they don't hear very much mm -hmm. pronunciation and they don't get a chance to practice it and be corrected on it by their professors. The Zoom has just opened up so many possibilities. It, it's opened up the possibility of us having a visitors to our classes yeah. uh, from the other part of the world. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was trying to think when uh, possibly a class you were in, I had Michael Bird visit. Michael oh, Bird I, at the time was in Australia. Right, yeah. Well, I, I would have remembered that. No, I, I think that happened after I left. Yeah, yeah, it wow. probably did. It probably did. That became... I, I'm uh, jealous. When, when we started using Zoom more, that's when it became yeah. much easier to do that sort of thing. Yeah. So technology is another basic difference. And then, um, and this is in tune with our culture in many ways. I have, I think I've become more in tune with the more understanding of diverse student backgrounds and understandings. Sure. Uh, I, I'm using a book that uh, uh, has the students write a self-statement near the beginning of their work on exegesis with the self-statement they describe their own social identity or social location, which is basically kind of a, a demographics kind yeah. of analysis okay. of themselves, gender, 
and race and uh, whether they're from a poor family, wealthier family, uh, what nation they might be from. We have now students from nations around the world coming mm-hmm. to class and that kind of thing. They describe their social location. They describe their theological identity, something about where they are in their theological understanding and where they've been. And uh, then they describe their life experiences. Mm-hmm. And I've, I've learned, I think, and am emphasizing more to the students how important those things are for our interpretation and how important it is as, uh, as I teach the students listen to understand and to, uh, to receive information from people of very diverse backgrounds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I think that's another thing that has really changed because in my early years in the 80s and probably well into the 90s, I probably had a tendency to assume that most students came from a background very similar to mine. Sure. And they had outlooks and interests very similar to mine. And I find that these days that is growing more and more diverse Mm -hmm. uh, from the students we get from undergraduate campuses, whether those affiliated with Churches of Christ or other ones, and the students that we're getting now from around the world. Because I would say now we have 15 to 20 international students and they're scattered around most of the continents. Mm-hmm. We don't have anyone from Antarctica. <laughs> Someday though, right? Yeah. Someday. <laughs> yeah. It's fascinating too that um, that you can see that um, you can see that reflected in in the students who come that as as there has been sort of a greater emphasis. It, it within church culture, so you know, bracketing you know, larger culture, but within church culture, there's been there's been a a, a real push a lot here in the last uh, you know maybe a decade or so to to really understand and um, understand for the point of inclusion to understand yeah. to the, for the point of including uh, folks from a variety of backgrounds, and it is not always based on skin color that's a huge component of it but it has been interesting to see how or to hear just in this last few minutes to hear how you as a dean and professor of new testament have adjusted your teaching because you are seeing these kinds of conversations playing out in the broader culture playing out in churches helping folks to maybe better understand themselves I think this is really kind of where I was wanting to narrow down on helping folks who, whether they're going into doctoral programs or, or, or to do ministry work in some capacity, this kind of uh, you know, self-reflection exercise that you were describing really helps them understand themselves, which is an absolutely essential component to effective ministry. Because if you can begin that process of understanding yourself and, and, and critically reflecting, critically in the best possible sense, critically reflecting on yourself, why you behave the way you behave, you know, other factors and influences, uh, you know, growing up, family of origin, church of origin issues, things like that. You can begin there and then gradually start doing that more with other folks, hopefully leading to uh, spiritual growth and maturity and development and all those kinds of things. Absolutely. And it's our, our student body has grown more diverse, mm-hmm. which I, I think it would be considerably more diverse now than it was when you were here, especially through a link we've made with an organization called Global Christian Studies mm-hmm. that is helping with 50% of the tuition from the students from uh, Africa, Ukraine, Europe, South America, uh, quite a variety of places. As we get more students and go into the class where there are students from the global south and students from Asian backgrounds, it is not only can I talk about the New Testament and the Old Testament being built in societies that are shame honor societies Mm -hmm. or honor shame societies, 
I can have students within the class talk about that from their personal experience yeah. of yeah. being a part of an honor shame society. Yeah. And so there, there's tremendous benefit to gain from the diversity of our students and from understanding your own background and where you are coming from, because it has a tremendous amount of effect even though you're trying to be as objective as possible. Sure. You cannot be as objective as you would like to be mm -hmm. without understanding your subjective factors. Yeah. It, uh, I'm glad you mentioned that particular example of viewing the New Testament and the interactions that, you know, that Jesus and the Pharisees would have, for example, viewing it through the lens of cultural values of honor and shame. And how for many folks, you know, like us, grew up you know, here in, in the South. Uh, you grew up in Georgia, is that right? Rome, Georgia? That's yes. Home? Okay. Yeah. Rome, um, Georgia, and then Birmingham, Alabama. That's right. So I was Georgia and Alabama for my, uh, through the 12th grade. Yeah, yeah. And so, like, I, I grew up in Nashville. And so, like, we, we are from the South. And um, there's... There's some aspects, right? If you know where to look, you can find some aspects of, of, of honor and shame, um, yeah. especially when you get to like, don't do anything that would shame the family, and things along those lines. But especially folks from other cultures that are closer in, uh, in proximity and closer in, in sort of uh, in characteristics to an ancient Near Eastern a first century Judean or you know, it, 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 you know, pa Palestinian in the geographical sense, right? Palestinian right. culture. Um, it's really fascinating to see how, how these folks would read the gospels and, and have the same kinds of, or have similar kinds of reflections that, um, that we see in the gospels when it comes to issues of honoring Jesus's word over, say, burying one's father or something along those lines. It was always fun talking with uh, one of my best friends from my doctoral program who is from Osaka, Japan. And he had a, he had a much more clearly defined sense of honor than, uh, than many of the rest of us. Not that we were insensitive to those kinds of issues, but he, he would be able to talk about them because that was a that was a cultural value for him that he he lived day in and day out you know, his entire life uh as a kind of conjoined to that and just an illustration of how i'm continually learning i have been for years saying that we americans don't understand much about honor and shame but then i would turn to say an Asian student who was connected with the class to talk about that. And only a few years ago, I had a couple of students that I know extremely well uh, who were uh, willing to kind of educate me gently in class that uh, both of them were African-American, both of them had grown up in the hood. And they mm -hmm. said, we know a lot more about honor and shame then you're giving us credit for it. wow fascinating right and, and it was so here was a diversity within mm -hmm. the students i've been talking to for years right. but an issue i had overlooked in many ways yeah well and and the issue there was you know the fact that in in the u.s and it, i guess it is tough to talk accurately about u.s culture because you know in, in some ways i mm -hmm. suspect that yeah, the culture down here in Corpus Christi, Texas, is uh, is in some ways very similar to what you would experience in Memphis, Tennessee. But uh, we also have a, a a beach vibe that yes. you're not going to find in Memphis, and uh, we also have. I mean, I'm three hours away from the Mexico border, and if I'm if I'm remembering correctly, Corpus Christi is majority Hispanic terms of demographics mm -hmm. and so it, those uh, the, those factors in and of themselves make for a, a different culture there's still very much a, a a typical or stereotypical texas style culture which has a lot of affinities with 
Southern culture than you and I would have grown up with. But even within Southern culture, there's, you know, there's a handful of, um, of subcultures. And it's fascinating that these particular Absolutely. students were able to say, actually, my, my subculture of where I grew up and you know, in terms of race and socioeconomics and things like that might allow me to be able to speak to this in a way that that's that's fascinating I, they've also very very generous of them very gracious of them to you, i think you said kindly educate you or politely educate you yes <laughs> yes i was i was very very pleased with their comments and i learned a lot and i continue to maybe if i could teach 38 more years <laughs> i'd be closer to where i ought to be on this and some <laughs> other years. yeah i i won't tell you who said this but i you could probably guess um, he's a dear friend of yours and a colleague and has been teaching with you for a while. <laughs> I guess that probably gives it away. <laughs> yeah, man. But I was, uh, I, I was talking with him one time. I, I forget precisely what the context was, but he said, well, you know, Kevin, the Alan Black that we got back in the 80s is not the Alan Black that we have today. <laughs> and and what he meant by that was, yeah, that probably gives it away because he remembers you from the 80s. <laughs> what he meant by that was the Alan Black that we got back then was a, was a good researcher. He was a good teacher. He was a good communicator. And he has only gotten that much better. And he has only grown that much more. It, it's interesting. Um, I, I, I would think it's interesting to be in a position where you've been teaching for decades and to, to look back and think, wow, I really have grown a lot. I really have developed and, and, you know, become maybe better at my craft, not because I am the most, not because my syllabus is the largest or you know, I, I, I'm, I'm the most powerful lecturer or something along those lines, but for the reasons that you said, you've become more pastoral. You've become more attuned to presenting material in a way that actively engages your students. Mm -hmm. uh, through, you mentioned discussion-based uh, kinds of things. And, um, you know, you're more sensitive to these kinds of cultural issues that do in one way or another influence how we understand um, issues related to interpreting the Bible. So. When I'm 110 and look back, maybe I will realize have a, uh, that I wasn't doing what I should be doing in the uh, 220s. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Yeah, that's right. Well, I'll look you up then. <laughs> <laughs> You can wait for the follow-up here, follow-up interview here in another 30 years. That sounds great. <laughs> I, we'll plan on it. If I'm here at 110 <laughs> and you're still around, which you probably will be. I, I hope so. Great. Yeah. That would make me only in my <laughs> 60s. <laughs> yeah. Um, let me ask this. What, because um, I, I, I think you've mentioned some of these before. What are one or two consistent challenges you have seen students wrestle with during your tenure? You know, those change mm -hmm. and, and um, one way of addressing it is sort of looking at our, uh, our statement of mission at the school that HST challenges leaders to deeper faith in God and to higher standards of ministry mm -hmm. and scholarship. I don't think there's anyone that's ever been through HST or had anything to do with HST that would not say they have been challenged to higher standards of scholarship. Yeah. I don't think, and, and that is a challenge that yeah. so many students come here year after year. I don't know how you felt the first year, but I know part of my feeling with the first year was, can I do this? Right. And um, that, is, that is something we're trying to address better with new students. We have now a, a, a two-day spiritual retreat mm -hmm. that's a part of the basic course, advanced theological research. Good. A uh, part of which is to say, uh, here's what you can expect in the coming years of your work here. And part of that is to reassure them, you can do this. 
I mean, it is challenging, but you can do it. Yeah. I would say more in the past than in the present. There were many students when I was here was almost universal experience and uh, it has become less so, but there are still students who come here. They have not been introduced to the big world of biblical scholarship mm. to all across the board. They've only seen, if they've seen it all, if they know anything about biblical scholarship, they only know a very narrow uh, slice of Church of Christ and their writings, or maybe of evangelicals and their writings. Sure. But then they come here and we introduce them to the whole world of biblical scholarship. And for some, there is a, a uh, <clears throat> I'm looking for the word deconstruction. Yes, deconstruction yeah. and a reconstruction of right. their faith that creates a deeper faith in God, mm -hmm. a disorientation and a reorientation. And that was a major experience for you, for me, may have been an experience for you. I don't know. I think it is less than it used to be because yeah. students who have uh, taken Bible courses in our undergraduate programs are now being introduced yeah. to a bigger world earlier than they were when I was coming here yeah. uh, back in the back in the 70s. Mm -hmm. But I think those higher standards of scholarship that uh, questioning and doubting of various features about our faith and yet doing so in an atmosphere in which our faith is encouraged mm -hmm. and which uh, the vast majority of students who go through a disorientation also go through a reorientation. Yeah that helps them and creates their deeper faith in God and who they are for the future. And then I, I would say that uh, a major challenge these days are the, just the challenges of everyday ministry. Mm -hmm. Like you've experienced, especially in your years in Kentucky when you were preaching at church regularly or in the experience that you're having right now. Yeah. Uh, that, that learning how to take what we're doing in the classroom and take it into a church setting um, is, is a significant challenge. Right. And that's, that's really one of the things that actually causes, for me, it caused for me at least, the greatest degrees of growth that I experienced. And because I was, you know, the kinds of things that I was interested in were, well, biblical studies and I mean, that's, that, that seems readily applicable, right? I mean, especially where I was in Kentucky, um, you know, th there was an expectation that at least every quarter of the two classes that were being offered Sunday mornings or Wednesday nights, at least every quarter, there would be, there would be one class that was textual. It's like, well, that's it, pretty easy to put together a textual class when what I'd studied for the last four years in my MDiv and what I had been studying was you know biblical studies at a high level in route to get a phd in biblical studies but with uh, with other things like the kind of stuff that i'm teaching now right so i'm teaching a class on rooted in gary chapman's the five love languages that's not my forte man <laughs> that's another world <laughs> it is a very different world but that has created some growth within me because i have to figure out all right the skills that i had to learn how to do this over here i need to i need to those skills need to translate over to doing this kind of thing i need to the kinds of questions that i was training myself to ask over here about you know for my dissertation, and I mentioned this primarily because I know you'll be able to roll with me here about, you know, historiographical method and social memory theory. And, you know, are, we're really looking at different, different foundational approaches to history and historiography, whether it's a more modernist or critical realist approach, somebody like an N.T. Wright might say, or more postmodernist post approach like, you know, Chris Keith, um, Anthony Ledun, you know, Rafael Rodriguez, those guys would say, I need to be able to handle all of that. The skills that I use to handle all of that, I need to take those skills and transplant them over here. That is something that I 
I remember feeling like I needed to learn how to do on my own so I could get the most out of what I was learning there at HST and later on at Asbury. That's a sort of good point. And I'm not sure who most of your audience is who are listening to this and other podcasts you do. Uh, but if there are a group of those people who are listening to it, who feel like they were lost for the last two or three minutes <laughs> while you were talking, uh, that's exactly what, I mean, what you're, what you did in those areas you're talking about mm -hmm. is not unapplicable to your church setting, right. but, uh, it, it can't be just brought straight into your church classroom. Yeah. And discussed at that point, yeah. and uh, you you build skills that you learn how to apply to a wide variety of things. Mm -hmm. This issue of deconstruction, I think, is pretty fascinating. I, I honestly had forgotten that that was the case, but looking back, especially my time, because I, I was there from 2010 to 2014 uh, there in Memphis with you, and you and I, you know, privately we would be able to name names, but you and I, it's, it's just sort of general. It's the case that you know, year in and year out at a school like HST, you have folks who do come in with a particular view of, well, when you study the Bible, these are the parameters. These are the things that we know. Right. And essentially they come to get the, get the sheet of paper at the end of the program that says, I know the things that I already know, and I know them really well. <laughs> and then you gradually realize, oh, wait a second, why are there people who seem like they're really smart. Why are they studying the Bible? And not only do they come to different conclusions than I do, they come to some radically radical conclusions that uh, these guys aren't even Christians. Why are they studying the Bible? And they're not even Christians. That's a rude awakening for a lot of folks. It is. I, when I came here, uh, I can remember arguing with the person who would turn out to be my best friend during the time that I was here, Barry Blackburn, who you may know. I do, yeah. Uh, and may, you may have had his Gospel Mark class, I'm not sure. I, I missed it, yeah. But uh, Barry and I, Barry was here for the Master of Theology. I was here for an MA, and I thought I knew a lot, and a year of training here would be all I needed. It wasn't that I thought I was only gonna get a piece, piece of paper. But I thought that in a year, I'd have the base I wanted to have to go on from here. And during that year, I became disoriented enough. I deconstructed enough yeah. Yeah. that I suddenly knew that I need to stay here for the MTH. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I appreciate you being, being willing to, uh, to mention that. Let me ask this uh, next question, Dr. Black, and I'm aware of our time. Um, what are some of your favorite memories from teaching? You've been doing this a while. I, yes, yes. I, you know, I love everything about teaching. I, I love preparation. Except and, Moodle. <laughs> yes, yes. Now, Moodle, that's another issue. Unfortunately, we're using Canvas, which right. is better it's than much Moodle. much easier program these days. These are, for anyone that might not know, a, a, a platform by, by which we put things online and yep. interact online. Um, I, I love the preparation in terms of book work and Bible work and just sitting and pouring over the text and pouring through uh, others' comments about the text. And I think probably that those of us that end up doing PhDs uh, in any area of the humanities are somewhat bookworms, and we enjoy that to a certain extent. Sure. We enjoy yeah. sitting by ourselves and doing that preparation. But I love the live interaction. Mm -hmm. And if it weren't for that, I, I quickly learned, there might have been a time when I thought I would be a scholar who would spend, you know, 70% of their time reading books and writing books. And, uh, but I, I quickly learned that that was not who I was. I was a teacher. Mm -hmm. And I love the classroom. I love the interaction with students. I love the, the questions that they have. And uh, you, you will know this only too well. I also love chasing rabbits. I, do, I don't mind occasionally, you know, we, 
a student spies a rabbit over there and says, let's go look at this for a while. Mm -hmm. And I go running down that path and uh, just, just enjoy the interaction and the lively thought of engaging in a classroom. And um, I love graduation. We're coming up on graduation a week from Friday. Mm -hmm. Every year I get a charge at graduation. And the reason is that I get to look at 2025. We have 28 students this That's year. Great. And when I look at what they're doing and what they plan to do, I just think, wow, I got to be a part of that. Mm -hmm. And so it's, you know, th those are memories and there are various students that represent my memories who are out there. And there are students that uh, sometimes send me a nice note close to graduation time. And I have a folder I put them in. And on a rainy day, I'll get them out and look at them. If I'm really down on myself, it's a good time to get that set of notes out and look through them. Mm -hmm. And those represent great memories. And in many ways, even greater memory is a student I haven't had any contact with in 10 years. If they get in touch with me and they say, I'm still using your notes from such and such a class. And I wanted to ask you about so-and-so. Yeah. I got a note, uh, an email today from a student that I haven't thought of his name in 10 years. And he's writing to ask a question about the gospels that he's discussing with an unbeliever. Mm -hmm. And he wanted to me because he'd taken some courses of the gospels. Yeah. He knew I was very interested in the gospels. He wanted me to help him with some resources to help in that situation. Yeah. I love that part of that's teaching. Great. So that's great. Dr. Black, it has been an absolute pleasure to get to talk with you uh, some this afternoon about uh, about your career, to look back at, at some of these times. I know uh, if I'm remembering correctly, right, and it, I mentioned social memory theory earlier, and it, it, one of the things is uh, sort of the, the unpredictability of memory. So if I, I'll preface this yes. by if I'm remembering correctly, <laughs> I, I remember sitting at the church that I would uh, later start working for up in central Kentucky. And uh, the preacher there now, who's a colleague of yours in Cersei, um, he had, uh, he was preaching through Hebrews 11 and talked about his cloud of witnesses. And uh, he mentioned among other folks, uh, you. And I thought, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm right there with you. That is, um, it's fascinating that, uh, you know, I, I like to tell people that when I was at HSC, I majored in Black and Oster because I took as many, many New Testament textual courses as would allow because I was in route to a PhD. And I, I found myself more gravitating towards the kinds of uh, classes that Dr. Oster taught, but because you and I spent so much time together as, uh, you know, as professor and graduate assistant and then also because of your work with the Student Association and uh, my work with the Student Association, I, I was able to see very closely how you, how you carried yourself as a professor and, and how you would occasionally you know, talk with me about a, about a situation that was a, a tough situation and you know, the student really needed either some help or you know, was, uh, was undergoing something fairly serious and i i've tried to model that as best i can and so i appreciate that and i also can speak for yeah, literally everybody else i know who has uh, who has gone through hst and has had you uh, or so appreciative of um of your christ-like spirit your many years of service and especially especially your wife nancy for uh, for being so uh, for going through this with you and really uh, and really walking with you uh, side by side through these uh, through these many years nancy is the best part of who i am <laughs> thank you so Amen. much uh for those comments for that encouragement mm -hmm. i know you'd be talking about jordan guy i don't think he's not <laughs> no. Name. No. preaching that sermon uh that that is um uh, that's humbling and very honoring. 
to to be mentioned and call up witnesses. I have to say it's also a little bit horrifying <laughs> because the cloud of witnesses are all dead. <laughs> <laughs> maybe um maybe cloud is not the best <laughs> maybe the stadium of witnesses i don't know <laughs> i think if we look at you know who was that uh, hebrews had in mind <laughs> he had bought a bunch of dead people i think he had his uh, his own dad in that mix too so it's <laughs> <laughs> maybe so <laughs> yeah thank so, you so much for the yes, interview sir. it's been great yes, i've sir. enjoyed it dr blank Take care, sir, and it's always a pleasure. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.